One of the most important things that we face at this juncture as we continue on is how God is spirit. Because the scripture is very plain on numerous occasions to say that God is spirit, we get the impression that that's all that he is. That he's not really tangible. And consequently, if we don't see him in some tangible way, that God is a person, we have depersonalized him. And this is where people create a God of their own idealism. But you can't depersonalize God. We're going to look into the Godhead. Uh, won't be this uh, institute, but it's right ahead for us. And when we see it, we're going to see very importantly that God is a person who has this plan who has this God idea and who works it out. But he's also spirit. In John uh, chapter 4 at uh, verse 24 it says God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Christ speaking of course to the a woman of Samaria and delivering his great message to her. But for the scripture to say that God is spirit is not to say that he's not tangible, he's not real. And I think it's important that we get this fixed in our mind because he's a God who has a mind and who has a voice because it said he spoke the worlds into creation. So that the world is not just a spirit thing that come about, but we see the world as a very tangible place coming from God who had a very tangible idea. God is spirit. And when God possesses man, man is spirit at the core of his being. Now what God's intention is by placing his spirit within us, Christ in us, is that we might come to know the things that have to do with God. It's like this little verse says in John 4 and 24, God is spirit and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and truth, is that we must become spirit beings to understand literally what it is God is doing. This means that the only way you really face the issue of how to live in the creation is to become knowledgeable of spirit and to see yourself as spirit. Only spirit beings can know the things that be of God. 1 Corinthians 2 is very clear on the subject that natural men cannot know and understand the things that be of the Spirit of God. For well, they're only known as the Holy Spirit reveals them to us. We have been demoralized by religion along the way in an unbelievable way. I think of the many years I preached that the gospel was a simple gospel. And what I meant was that uh, any spirit being could understand what God is doing. But the way people took it was that any sinner can figure out the plan of God. And that's not so. He can't do it by figuring it out. He can only come to know God by simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is a spirit thing. So as spirit beings born again, birthed by God's spirit in us, God's nature in us, we can come to know the things that be of God. Now I'm sure what has happened to us along the way is that we never came to the understanding that we were spirit beings. And as a result, we never understood the things that be of God. I hardly have an institute anywhere, but what somebody doesn't come to me and say, why is it we didn't know these things? Why is it we weren't taught these things? Why is it they're not generally taught today? And of course me being a, a nobody, they wonder how in the world I got a hold of these things. Who are you? And mainly who am I sitting here listening to you? 
because it's so outrageous, it's so unbelievable. But the facts are the very simple spirit beings come to know the things that be of God. So that means we can't translate the world by the things that we see. We can't look at the world and what's happening to us in the world as the two verses we read previously said, for the things that are seen are not the real things that have to do with the Spirit of God. The only way you understand God is by being a spiritual being, for the things of a spirit God are known only by spirit beings. So consequently, we're going to have to be taught by the Holy Spirit to come to see and to know these things. So what is, what is uh, working in us now is this big thought that what's in the world and has been created has to do with Jesus Christ. It's hard to look at somebody dying with a cancer and say Jesus has to do with that because our first thinking is by the obvious outside thing that says death and Satan and disease are eating up a good person here. But that's not what's working at all. That's what we see. That's what we see as natural beings. That's not what is happening as spirit beings. As spirit beings, we have to see through it, not God in the cancer, but we have to see through it that God is working even in what appears to be a negative thing. So the only way we can live life is by subjection to the Father who is spirit. A little verse you need to mark in Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 9. Furthermore, and, and this, this verse comes behind one of the severest things said in the scriptures, that if the believer doesn't endure chastening, he's a bastard. And so he's really compounding this thought in verse 9 saying, Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits, unto our spiritual Father, and live? Now what we don't know about is how to be in, suggestion, in subjection to a spiritual father. It's hard for us to comprehend that. It is very difficult for us to take the crises we have in life and say, by these we're in subjection to our father. Because most of our religious training has been that we can pray and believe God and change the circumstance. Now let me say this. There are some circumstances, circumstances we can change. The Bible is filled with innumerable testimony to the God who can change certain circumstances. But generally speaking, the change of a circumstance in the world that you live in does not change the circumstances that are put in creation. The insolvable problems that we have now in the universe are a part of God's creative scheme to bring crises to free moral agents. And we're not going to get rid of those. There are times that you'll go into a fiery furnace and it won't burn you. Christ will be seen in it. There will be other times that you go to the front door of a fiery furnace and God will take it away and you won't have to go in at all. There will be other times that you'll go into a fiery furnace and you won't find a blessed soul in there but you. <laughs> you say, well, the first time we believed and got a miracle, he took it away. Second time we believed and Jesus met us in the trial. Third time you must have had sin in your life. <laughs> but the fact is, the fire furnace was made by the Father. The difference in the treatment is how you see it. 
seeing him and knowing him is the message that's going to liberate this world from the hurt and pain. But dear friends, it isn't being liberated from hurt and pain that is the essence of our existence. The purpose of our existence is to come to know him in whom to know is life eternal. So we're going to have a blending of that along the way. Sometimes he's going to take the furnace away and sometimes you're going to walk in it and he'll give you strength. But in all of it, his purpose is that you're spirit being and he's the father of spirits and the only way you are to live is in that union with him. Now, in 1 John 4 and 6, we have an understanding as to how to make all this work, at least the beginning of that understanding. In 1 John chapter 4, let's begin reading at, uh, well, begin reading at verse 1. I think we need the whole context here. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now already is in the world. Now let's comment upon this, at least briefly. Every believer that says, in every event, I see Jesus in this created thing, that's flesh, in created things, is of God. And every believer that cannot see Christ in flesh is not of God. That's the spirit of the Antichrist. That time will come and is already in the world Ye are of God, ye are of God, little children, and have overcome the false prophets and the Antichrist, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We often quote the latter part of those verses, greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. But these words come at the close of him saying that every thing in the flesh confesses that Jesus Christ has come and can be seen in this. Now, this means primarily, of course, Jesus of Nazareth, who came into the world in the flesh and subjected the world to himself. But I see a deeper meaning here, that by now we having Christ in us are able to see Christ has come in the flesh once again, and by that rules over everything in this realm of environment because it has to do with him. Now this brings us to the question. What is the purpose of this world? We see a technicality that there had to be a place where God could bring about the training of his sons. Training. That's not the best word to give that right now. There had to be a place where God could show his sons, educate them, bring them knowledge, which is different from training. You may get the idea that we're all just being trained by God to do something. But a free moral agent doesn't just have coercive training on him he has knowledge given to him, and out of love, he operates that knowledge. Can you see a difference there? I think the Holy Spirit is training me in a lot of areas. But I think the first important thing God did for me is to bring me knowledge, and then as a free moral agent, cause me to love him enough to begin to operate in that knowledge. 
What is faith? Faith is nothing but God's knowledge in operation in your life. Taking what God has said and putting it to work by you is an operation of faith. How does that work? By love. You love his word. You love what he said. And you will not work contrary to that. You will work in obedience to that word. That's a love act. So it is more than just training. We are being trained to work for the Father. But most of all, we're being furnished the information that's behind this God idea. And when that idea comes to us, out of love, God wants us to begin to operate in it. To be so swept up by this knowledge and this understanding, we will as free moral agents operate in it, seeing and knowing that that's really the only way we can get along in this world is by this God idea working. That's the way I function in this world. That's the way I am to live in this world. Now I've got everything but an eraser. And I need to unscribble this and rescribble here. <clears throat> so what we, what we really want <clears throat> is to get the world and its purpose firmly fixed. First big thought we must have. All things were finished in God's plan before anything was created. What does that mean? That means that the ultimate intention of God, <clears throat> the entire plan of God, the whole of God's purpose, Romans 8 and 28, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to to his purpose. The entirety of his purpose was finished before anything was created. Now the reason why I call the essence of the world an educational factor to believers is because I have had the experience on two occasions and part, I had the entire responsibility on two occasions, thank you Bob, on, on two occasions to make a syllabus for a Bible college. <clears throat> what that means is that you are establishing an educational institution that is to be based on a certain purpose. That purpose is to be finally and ultimately formulated before you sit down and spell out any of the syllabus that is to be a part of the curriculum. Now this is what God did. <clears throat> Before he did anything about establishing a curriculum, he established the purpose. All the way through scriptures, key scriptures, particularly in the New Testament, especially in the epistles, denote the priority of the purpose. It's Paul saying according to his purpose. So that purpose was completely formulated and in operation in the God idea which we introduced tonight. Now he has his plan all fixed in his mind. The God idea is completed. Hebrews 4 and 3. One of our other prime texts says that all of his works were finished before the foundation of the world. So the entire purpose of God was finished and completed. Note now what has happened. Purpose is finalized. What is his purpose in the God idea? to fill up his house with sons. The ultimate end of everything with Jesus of Nazareth was, in my father's house are many mansions, I go to prepare a place for you. So the ultimate end of the God purpose is to fill up his house with sons. Now we've seen how he has come to that purpose by free moral agencies and by creation 
producing a crisis that would make the free moral agent choose to love. We have the purpose. Now, we're going to have the technicality as to how this purpose will be brought about. The way it'll be brought about is that he's going to create a world that will be literally nothing other than than a schoolhouse in our vernacular. That's what the world is. The world is a created place to educate the sons of God to the purpose of God. Well, now, once again, I must keep before you why God goes through this long procedure. Why doesn't he just make a son like he wants him to be and be done with it? Why go about all of this messing around, creating the world, tree of knowledge of good and evil, men getting mad at each other, church people mad at each other, <laughs> world mad, why go to all this trouble? Why not just make what you want, your God? Make it and be done with it. It's because the purpose is love. Ever keep in your mind now as we go through this that you can't get love anywhere except on a reciprocal basis of freedom. There must be choice. That's so all the world is in God's plan is a schoolhouse. We have studied when we talked about the dispensations of an educational program of how God proved the necessity of placing another in the creature to save them by five different ways he put people through schooling. In the dispensation of innocence and conscience and human government, promise and finally law, all of which was nothing but a test given to men by God to bring them to Christ. Paul was to finally teach that the law was nothing but a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. So the purpose in the creation of the world was to create a place that would house and contain this educational process which is necessary for a free moral agent. That's why you were born into this world as a sinner and started out at zero with God and was finally by the crises that are built into this world brought to a place to where you saw your need of a Savior. You could not save yourself. And then after you were saved, brought to another crisis, you couldn't live what it was you believed you could live. You needed someone else to live it for you. So our whole life is made up of the processes that come out of our schooling. The schoolhouse is but a place where God can renew and train the sons. Now, it behooves us to understand how that the world's schoolhouse creates the possibility of renewal. And this you ought to see. In the tripartite man, man made of body, soul, and spirit, in the unconverted form, it's Satan's spirit. When a creature comes into the world like this, there is awaiting him an alleviation from the hurt and pain of life and a deliverance to the things of God. By the work of Christ on the cross, this creature has had these marvelous things to happen to him. The first and most important thing that happened to him is that by the cross, Satan is out 
and Christ is put in as his spirit or nature, for he has become a partaker of divine nature, born again. But notice, in the plan of God, the only thing that was to be saved, the only place there would be any salvation was in spirit. It was never intended by God that salvation be anywhere else. For instance, there is no salvation or regeneration for body equal to spirit. He never intended to save the body. He never intended to regenerate the body of man. It is a body of sin, it is corruptible, and it will be so until the resurrection morning. Now, I said it was never his intention to save the body. The body will be absolutely regenerated, but only on the resurrection morning. Remember Paul saying, we are saved now by hope. What does he mean by that? That means that you are only saved in spirit and you're saved by hope in body because on the resurrection morning, this mortal will put on immortality. That's when you get a new body. In the meantime, there's no salvation for body except by faith. We know we'll get it one of these days, but in the meantime, you don't get it. And yet we're all tricked along the way into thinking bodies are saved. We've all been, well, some of you have maybe. I have been a time or two. I've gotten so wrapped up in faith at times, I thought that the body could be saved. I've had two or three flourishes in my life where I got ideas that you can get so much faith, you'll never get sick again. If you had enough faith, you'd just live on and on. And if God took you, he'd just have to hit you in the head. <laughs> well, I'm not the first one that had that idea. The folks at Thessalonica had the same idea. That's what first epistle of Thessalonica is written about. They got so much faith working there and they had so much healing working there that the brethren uh, started preaching that if we keep our faith and have enough faith, we'll never die. Good never die doctrines. And that's a tremendous doctrine until somebody dies. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what happened at Thessalonica. One of the believers finally died and uh, they come run to Paul and said, none of it works. Don't work. Gospel doesn't work. Faith don't work. Paul said, what's wrong? Well, we believe that if you had faith, you wouldn't die. This fellow died. Oh, Paul said he didn't die. Oh, he is. Paul, we, we buried him. The guy's in the tomb out here. No, he's not dead. Now, this is Thessalonians. Read it. He didn't die. He just fell asleep. And on the resurrection morning, the shout of the Lord and the voice of the, the, voice of the archangel and the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first and we that wait to be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. He's not dead. It's the way Paul treated it. It was a big it don't matter thing to him. So we all get worked up where we won't get body saved. Kind of funny if the church put as much emphasis on spirit as it does on body, we'd really have much more happiness in this world. It's hard for us to do this. So there is no salvation here, and there is no salvation for soul. Soul, or the mind, is constantly growing. When you get saved, there have been times that... Uh, I've taught that at salvation, a technical thing happens to mind in that the mind becomes quiescent. It becomes uh, at point zero. That whatever you start putting in that mind determines what kind of person you're going to be from that point on. But that's not so for everybody because a lot of people who get saved got the same old mind. We've got some of them in our fellowship they still talk the vernacular they did when they was unsaved. Their mind hasn't caught up with spirit yet. You've all seen that. Been a lot of people got saved who still cussed after they're saved, but in time they bring that mind under subjection to spirit as they learn and as they grow in the Lord. And, and many of us that get, when we got saved, didn't understand all these uh, 
bewildering things that church people teach, and so we had to grow into that. We had to become as dead as they are. <laughs> it, took, it, it took time for us to get there. But uh, the process is that there is no salvation instantaneous for man. The mind is a continual process. It is always growing. A little lady came to me the other night in Toronto and she said, what's the end of all this? I said, the Father's house. She said, well, we're just going to be all smart there. And I said, no, we're still going to be studying the Word there. I believe that. I believe we will study the Word even in the Father's house. Because I don't think we've even scratched the surface of knowing what's in this book. I heard a preacher this morning on television down in California just briefly uh, as I had only a moment to listen to him, but he was telling us that it's already all, all said. There is no more. You take what I say or you don't get any more. And there is no more of God for us. We got that by the birthing. We got everything that the Lord can possibly give us by being born again, having His Spirit in us. But there's so much more to understand about that. There's more understanding. There's more understanding that unlocks his, his blessings and His grace, which we don't know. And we don't want to confuse the idea by saying, well, I got it all and that's it, with the fact that we never will have full understanding of it all. I was reading the other day in a, in a scientific magazine, as I said, in a doctor's office, about the fact that the brain is very slightly ever used by the average human being. And I can't remember all the statistics that gave it. Blew my mind right off. But we use so little of it. And surely God knows that the mind that we have can continue to expand and grow. And as I'm always telling people, when I first started preaching nearly 40 years ago, I knew everything there was to know. <laughs> and after I ran into a few preachers and churches and deacons. I didn't know one thing. <laughs> I mean, I went the other extreme. From knowing it all to knowing nothing. And now for the rest of my life, I see I'm going to be learning. I'm so glad Paul put it like that when he said, we have not so <coughs> learned Christ. You used to think that was bad English. He didn't say learned about Christ. He said, we have not so learned Christ. That's good English. Because we're not to learn about Him. We're to learn Him as He is in us. So that's something that never will stop. You see, we don't really have that in our minds yet. We preach and taught grace all our life. Grace is another person given to us who is our substitute, who is our identity, who is our all. We've been taught that all our life, but it's not really into the mind yet. And, and that's why we go through this and why we have institute and why we need the fellowship of one another is because that's constantly working out of us. It kind of work into us and then it works out of us because we revert very easily. We revert back to our old way of thinking. So there is no instantaneous salvation for the mind or the soul. It's always growing. And it's, it's sad that, that we have this connotation given to us in the Scripture that our soul is saved. And some people get a hold of that and think, well, I know all there is to know about God. But that's not really what it means. The saving of our soul is the mind turned to Christ. So what's really saved at salvation is the spirit part of man. And what's really regenerated is that Satan our former spirit is put out and Christ is put in. Now we don't really know all there is to know about that. We don't understand everything there is to understand about that. Some of us have been in the church a long time and never lived like that. So now it seems important that we find out what this process is called God's love and God's grace. I say it's a process that takes place in a world that is a schoolhouse to God and the purpose of everything in this world is to teach us these things that be of God. Who we are. That's what it's all about. The whole 
world system is to teach us who we are in Christ. If we preach not the gospel, multitudes of God's people will be in derision, will be frustrated, will be confused, and will be turning from one self-effort to another all the days of their life, not knowing there's any other way to live. This is why God is moving like he is even in our midst that we might get hold of what it is he is doing and begin to tell it to others. Tell it to the world. Preach the gospel to all. So the only way the mind is really going to come to know what it is God's doing in his purpose is by the schoolhouse. So he brings us into this world. We're all born into this world. Now, the birthing into this world is the entering into the schoolhouse. We kind of start at the three-year-old kindergarten. <laughs> and we start growing up in Christ. But like every schoolhouse, there are classrooms. And the the classrooms in the schoolhouse are the circumstances and situations of life. Now, some of you immediately, when I put that before you, think about awful situations and a bad catastrophic things that happen, and we'll get to that in a moment. But let me tell you what God has done in the schoolhouse called world. He said that it is not good for man to live alone in this schoolhouse. So I'm going to create a circumstance for him. <laughs> a classroom <laughs> with a definite subject in mind. Are you following me? Did you know that in this world, marriage is a distinctive circumstance created by God to bring men to Christ? Now notice, the believer is already chosen in Christ by a birthing. We get into Christ by God planting his incorruptible seed in us. Now, how are we going to come to the knowledge of that? How are we going to come to this greater understanding of what God is doing unless we have classrooms that teach us the specifics of what God wants. So notice what he did. How do we have the slightest conception that the Father has put an incorruptible seed in us unless we have an understanding of how human birth takes place? So for a creature who was to be birthed by a father, God said, I'm going to give them the illustration, the understanding, the prototype of this, because man and woman are going to get together and the man is going to put his seed in the woman and cause the birthing of a child. Now I'm going to let this happen in the world schoolhouse as a distinctive circumstance in their life because I want them to come to know what it is I've done to them. We don't have a good understanding of that, do we? Because we think that's what life is. No, that's the great illustration of what it is the Father wants in our thinking for the sons who live in his house. Why? Because marriage won't exist. Our natural earthly marriages and the birthing of our children 
and our families will not exist in the Father's house. They're classrooms. They are the way and means by which we were to come to know what God was doing for us. They won't continue. Oh, we'll know each other. I'm sure there'll be a tenderness and a love there, but there is no marriage. There is no bringing forth the children by us. The birthing of the Father is a predominant thing, and that was in purpose before the world was created. So what happens in the created world is merely to promote, to show, to educate, and to enlighten us as to what purpose was before creation. I was talking to one of you before at the break about uh, the uh, abortion deal that's going on up at Beaverton. Is that where it is? Forest Grove. Forest Grove. And uh, do you understand that all things that are happening in our world have to do with God's purpose before the world started? Because he finished all his works then. Right? Our Hebrews is clear to say. So even though I've told you before, I've got to remind you again on the basis of this point that marriage is to show us godly birthing, how we become sons of God, children of God. But look at this extraneous situation in our world today called abortion. Why is it here? Why has God allowed this to take place? Two or three reasons. First reason is we don't understand the seed. We don't understand that God plants a seed in us and that's total God in us, his total nature in us at the implementation of that seed. The moment you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have cohabitated with God. A seed has been planted in you and your birth, a new creation in Christ. We don't understand that in the church today. Not even people who are always preaching on being born again understand it like that. So what does God do in the schoolhouse? He's got a severe classroom going on right now that is showing to every believer that the moment that seed is planted, that's life. Not some life, not part life, not half life. That's whole, total life. We didn't preach that in the church like that. We've not really preached that. We preach now every one of you come to church in Sunday school and get more of God. That's really been the concept behind it. Let's serve God because we'll get more of it. We haven't really zeroed in on the fact that a birthing has take place, taken place. We have total God in us now or no God. It's one or the other. I used to preach you're either saved or you're not saved. That got around the subject. That didn't really hit the nail on the head. The fact is, I've either been birthed or I haven't been birthed. It's just that simple. What is abortion? That's a classroom, a far out classroom. Won't always be here. Wasn't always here. We didn't know what the word meant 20 years ago, hardly. Wasn't a big issue. God allows these issues to come. That's crisis point in our world. God allows it to come, to show and to, to, that everything that has been created is dovetailing into purpose. It's crowding us to Christ. What is it believers are saying now, and some of them willing to give their life, that when that seed is planted, that's life. Don't tamper with it. Don't kill that baby. Don't abort it. Why? That's not the big message. The big message is that's what happens to every believer who is born again. He has total God in him. He has the Christ life in him, and his whole purpose of existence is to know that, learn that, live that, operate as that. This isn't anything we've done. It's something the Father does by these outside powers. So the schoolhouse is in operation. It's all it is. I'll tell you what'll happen, and I'm no prophet. I'm just a bit of a little bit of a historian, and not a big one of those, I guess. But I'll tell you what'll happen. It'll pass. The abortion issue will pass. You saw it with pornography. I thought about it last week when some of our wayward Dallasite people 
had created the big issue, 7-Eleven's run from Dallas, over pornography. That looked to be a hopeless issue, didn't it? Yes. Looked to be a hopeless issue. I really thought it would. I didn't think they'd ever even bring the slightest bit of retaliation against the pornography crowd because they have First Amendment backing them up. But you know what I see? I don't believe it was Falwell or any man. I believe it was God running the schoolhouse that he balances all things in time. He'll do that with abortion. He'll do that with Gaddafi. He'll do that with the terrorist. Everything operates out of the schoolhouse. Where should our trust be? Our trust should be in him. Our trust is in Christ. I trust in Him. I don't have faith it's going to all work out because as sure as I'd prophesy it's going to work out, I'd be like the Jehovah Witnesses. I read a report on them the other day that since 1914, they've declared the coming of Jesus four times and He wouldn't take them up on it a single time. <laughs> That's kind of the way I'd be. <laughs> so I'm not saying by faith this is going to happen. I'm saying my trust is in him. I've learned this in the schoolhouse. <clears throat> Devil may operate today. He may operate tomorrow in a certain area, but he won't operate in endlessly because he doesn't run the schoolhouse. May look bad today, may look bad tomorrow, but it's not going to continue like that. The schoolhouse has the classrooms in it. And the classrooms are our circumstances and situations. I think I'm going to make some t-shirts that has, I'm overcoming the CNS gang. Because they're really working. Now you've heard lots about them. God creates a circumstance for you. You understand that? We have circumstances created for every one of us. Some of you have it in marriage. Some of you have it with your kids. Some of you have it with your business. You've got a circumstance. But what I found out about what circumstance you're in, like that's the subject you're taking for right now, and, and I want to encourage you, no subject lasts indefinitely. You either flunk it and go backwards or you go forward, but it don't just stay the same. I found this out in psychological counseling. I've encouraged more than one dear heart by that woman who says, I've lived with him 20 years and he ain't worth nothing. And I always said it won't stay like that forever. She said it's already been forever. <laughs> but I said now then that we're turning to God and we're going to ask the Father to help us, I promise you there'll be a change. And there's always been a change. As a marvelous miracle I saw in Christian counseling that I could guarantee a change. I've had a lot of radical changes. I had some of them that killed themselves between sessions. There was a change. <laughs> but there's always a change. <laughs> I think I told you about one little couple I had in counseling. The judge had sent them. They came from the courts. The judge said, I think they ought to try to work it out before I grant this divorce. So he sent them over to us. He had and I talked to them and, uh, long enough and got them back together and looked like they loved one another. And uh, several months went by and here they were back again. The judge had sent them back to me. And I said, well, I thought we got your problem solved. And uh, he said, you just thought you got them solved. I said, you know what she did the other day? No, I said, she shot me. <laughs> Come to find out they had an argument, she picked up a gun and shot him. <laughs> Hit him in the shoulder. I looked over and I said, kind of laughing, I said, why'd you shoot him? She said, I shot him because I loved him. <laughs> He said, yeah, I'm glad she didn't love me anymore. She missed me. <laughs> well, I got them back together again. I haven't heard from them since. <laughs> but there's, there's always a change. Every circumstance changes if you face that circumstance 
logically and sanely. Now notice I didn't say in faith or spiritually. They will certainly change if you face them and trust in God. But whether you have trust in God or not, circumstances change. There's always a movement in them because they're God-created circumstance brought about as crisis points for free moral agents. They're going to always be in the process of change or moving on. So you don't want to get weird in well-doing. There'll be some change in the circumstance. It's that way in sickness and disease. It's that way in every problem that we have. The circumstance is going to change. So we want to see that there are definite classrooms are subjects we have to take in this world. A little woman came to me some time ago and she said, I sure have a new classroom that I never thought I'd have to go through again. She said, I got my family raised after certain difficulty and said for a few years I had peace and said here comes one of my daughters back with three kids to live in my house and she's got to work to earn a living and I'm raising children again. She said I don't understand that. Why would God let that happen? It's even though we get out of a classroom there's always another to go into. You're never really free of that as long as we're in these bodies. Maybe you understand now why the apostle said we groan to be delivered from these bodies and get our resurrection body which is comparable to our spirit. It's because when that happens, we will cease to have the downward motivation pull out of our flesh. Now you don't understand flesh sometimes but flesh is always pulling you away from spirit in that it wants the mind given to itself. To think of nothing but flesh rather than spirit. That's because it's a built-in factor. It's just the way human beings are that are made out of dirt. And we'll look into that, I think, a little bit more later on. Our circumstances and situations are there. Now listen to this. You have a certain classroom that you're in right now. This classroom you're in is a God-arranged circumstance in your life. But by the way you treat that circumstance, do you have certain situations? If there's a difference between circumstances and situations, it is this. God creates the circumstance, the classroom that you're in. You, by your thinking, determine what the situation will be concerning that classroom. Now, I've never been too bright. I flunked the first grade. And along the way, I discovered a dislike for education because all my life, uh, not all my life, but the first 12 years of my education, I saw students ahead of me that were chums of mine when I started. And that always bothered me. They graduated a year before I did because I tried not to flunk again. And it always made me feel badly as I was a kid growing up. And what that did to me was put an unbearable pressure on me that I didn't recognize at the time because of the way I handled the situation. It was probably a good decision. If you can't pass the first grade, you need to stay there till you can. Because you don't want to just go on to another grade. That's the way education seems to do it now. 
just keep passing you whether you learned anything or not. But what I did was make a horrible situation out of it by the way I handled it. Now this is what we do in our circumstances. Maybe you got a marriage circumstance that's your training ground right now. It'd just be better to love each other than to fight it. That'd be smart. I told a lot of people that and it didn't mean a thing. <laughs> but that'd be smart because you're only creating a circumstance that's unnecessary by not finding out how you can work together, live together, love together, and be one. So much simpler to do that. But human beings that won't allow the mind to recognize what's happening in life create the unbearable circumstance. And the end result is we make it hard on ourselves. Now we're going to see in this institute, I hope, a good reason for the world, your being in it, and what's going on. And what I'll present to you will appear to be sure negative in its entirety. But the positive side is simply that this is the way God brings forth His Son in you. And we're going to take up in our next session the teachers that are in these classrooms. And you won't like them any better than you like the, like the subjects. But they'll have a good message for us. And this is going to be such a good time with you these days. And I think we'll stop right here. <laughs>